So first of all, as somebody who's uh, feels like literally I've worked for you, you know, this is a, you know, like a great honor, but I'd love to chat a little bit about the early days and, um, you know, like about how a young man pre video games kind of invents the entire industry and like what, what, you know, like what that's like, if, you know, like if you remember sort of these key moments, you know, obviously there's the stuff with the Magnavox Odyssey and, and like your inspiration for wanting to tinker around with that stuff. But if you could just kind of walk me through like what put you on this path in the early days. I like to describe my life as a series of happy accidents. And uh, perhaps the first one is there weren't very many kids in the world that were ham radio operators in the middle 50s. <laughs> and so that was kind of a thing. And and um, there was a older guy, a, a ham radio operator, down the block from me that was kind of my mentor. Mm. So I, I actually learned a lot of electronics at a very, very young age. That was happy accident number one. Happy accident number two was that I found that I had a facility for repairing television sets Interesting. of my neighbors. And so that was sort of my entrepreneurial go-to um, occupation during my early teens. And I made a lot of money and I got used to making a lot of money. Wow. Um, happy accident number three. Um, I worked summers at an amusement park uh, and became good at it and was actually promoted to become manager of the whole game department, uh, which included two arcades. Interesting. So I accidentally learned the economics of the coin-operated game business. Happy accident number four was that the University of Utah had Dr. Evans, hmm. and he was his sort of mission or where he was doing his research was connecting video screens up to big computers. Mm. So if you were to see a video screen connected to a big old IBM mainframe in, uh, in the middle 60s, there were exactly four places in the world that you would see such a thing. MIT, Stanford, Champaign-Urbana, and the University of Utah, where I was wow. going to school. So then the, the concurrence of my understanding of television technology from my repair shop when I was a teen to my understanding of the economics of the coin-op business, and then... I see the game Space War that was programmed by a couple of MIT guys and made its way to the university and was mesmerized by it and thought to myself, if this, if I could put this in my arcade with a coin slot, it would make money. But then you divide 25 cents in and for three minutes into a million dollar computer and the math didn't work. Right. But I sort of filed it away. Again, then I guess happy accident number five. Okay. When I graduated, I went to work in California at Ampex. Mm. And Ampex was kind of the premier video they made. They were in the business of basically creating television studios, cameras, uh, they invented the uh, the videotape recorder, mm. uh, instant replay. They had a whole bunch of firsts. And so I was working there, and our missions every day was actually 
video streaming technology. Wow. And, so, and what year is this roughly? Just so I have a little context. 1968 in Utah. Oh my lord, like the Beatles, the Beatles are still together. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you just blew my mind again, sir. That's mind blowing. And then um, and so um and then maybe the the happy accident number six. Or was it did I get to seven? Yeah, yeah, you get six, that's correct. Okay. Uh MSI technology, which was medium scale integration mm. got ubiquitous and important and when i started at ampex these little chips cost about three bucks mm. a year later they cost 15 cents wow and so um i one of my jobs at ampex was to create a test signal generator creating a video stream that would put us put a image on the video screen to test it. Okay. A little hardware hack. And that was the other happy accident because all of a sudden I saw and worked on and created a signal generator using MSI chips, discrete, to create a video picture. And the input was from a from a mainframe. No, no, no. That that particular unit was the, it. Just it was a it was it was basically a piece of test equipment. Okay. That it started out with a crystal, giving a frequency, and then it was divided down by flip flops and decoded with the Boolean algebra, you know, Boolean gates, ands, ors, what have. Wow. And. Uh, which was, which was exactly what the early video games were. Understand that I kind of say that my technology allowed for the video game to happen seven years sooner than it would have anyway, mm. because the microprocessor hadn't been invented yet. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So um, literally there was not a microprocessor that was anywhere close to being good enough until 1975, 76. And uh, my first game was 1969. Well, wow, your first game was 1969? Yeah, that was a game called Computer Space, which I licensed to Nutty. That's mind blowing because, like, for me, and I look, and I'm somebody that lives and breathes the video game industry on a daily basis. I, I own my own VR development studio. We have three games out in the market, so it's like worked at Rockstar Games. I was one of the early employees. Like, you know, I've I've been around, worked at Atari. I I've always the legend of Nolan is always that the first game is Pong, right? It, it, it kind of like those two things get connected together. But it's always in the like deep into the seventies. Like I, this is for me such mind blowing kind of SR seventy one level innovation because this is the late sixties that we're talking about. That's correct. Well, if you um, if you go in and just look at computer space, the you know we had a fiberglass cabinet 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 that was very very spacey, and uh, it oh, was that's awesome. just. You know, there's such a thing as innovating too much because it was the first time anybody had seen, you know, a game on a TV screen. You know, people, you know, the number of times people would ask me, they'd say, hey, Nolan, how does the TV station know that I push these buttons? You know, because in, in their idea, the only way you got something on your on a TV screen was when it came from a studio. Right. Yeah. So the whole idea of local interactivity was actually a bridge too far for a lot of people. Yeah. Let, let me ask you a question because this is something that I've struggled with myself, I think, over the years. And, and, and I'd love to get your insight on this. You said something that's so um, sort of biting to me, which is this idea that sometimes you can be too innovative or too ambitious. As somebody who's maybe seen that hallmark pop up again and again over time, what is the hallmark of knowing when you're going a little too far? 
I think he, I, I just think you get whacked around a little bit. For example, mm -hmm. computer space was a technological tour de force. Mm. I mean, it was really hard. It was really complex. And it did okay. Pong, which was technically a dawdle in right. comparison. I see what you mean. Was massively successful. Right, 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 right. Right. That's very interesting. And um, we as engineers like projects that challenge us, you know, and it's very easy to conflate things that are hard with things that will be successful. Absolutely and, no success, no correlation. And, and computer space, was it distributed as a sort of coin op arcade? Was that, was that the distribution method for it? Yeah, it was, it was an arcade game. It took quite and, and, and how many of them did you make? About 3,000. Oh, okay. And um, back in those days, such an early world, like would you pre-sell them or would you make them and then try to sell them? Well, there was a whole infrastructure of coin-operated game distributors. They had cigarette machines, jukeboxes, pool tables, what have you. And they would sell... And there would be basically two of them in every marketplace. Mm. So we'd sell to them and they'd sell to a distributor or to a, a, a route operator, a guy who'd go into the bars and say, let me put my sh machine in and I'll, you know, share the, share the revenue. And what that, what that mechanism did is the distributors actually provided the financing. Because oh, their kind of job was they'd let these operators buy these in time because the, these coin op operators were small businessmen, thinly capitalized, mom and pop operations. And so that they could pay us cash or cash in 30 days. Right. And, right. and, we, and so we could operate in positive cash flow. So, so you would get... Um a distribution deal prior to actually building the 3,000 units. So you would pre-sell them to a distributor. That, that, uh, I wouldn't say pre-sell is the right phraseology. It's sure. really more that um, they say, send me 10. You know, they're, you know, but there, there were 40 of them, 30 of right. them. Right. And so, I'd be on the phone and they just said, send me five, send me 10, send me five, you know, what have you. And, uh, and that would, that would happen every Monday morning. Wow. And, and, and the, the, uh, was there like revenue sharing? Like, like, was there like some kind of weekly or monthly collecting of all the quarters or whatnot? And then you would get like a little kickback or was it just, you sold it and it was theirs to monitor? Oh, it was done. Right. The, uh, the revenue share all happened at the bar level. Okay. Right between the um, the person right. hosting the the hardware and the person who bought it to uh, distribute it. So you were out of the picture at that point. Precisely. Gotcha. So, gotcha. So our Atari did early on have a small route where we would put machines out, and that was as much kind of for testing because we wanted to be able to put our machines out and and understand historically what games would do in that bar. Mm. Uh, and uh, and also, it was good cash flow. For example, the first computer space, and this is how it started, mm -hmm. uh, we had four prototypes that we took to the trade show, but they were, you know, they were all jerry rigged with jumpers on there on the on the pc board to fix the mistakes we'd made hmm. so they weren't really saleable to third parties because you know they they were not standard and so i bought those for you know we were selling the machines for 1200 bucks and i bought them for 300 and put them on a route and they'd make 300 dollars a week so it was a really good deal and that's part of how i funded the start of Atari. Oh wow! I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at, at 
at the uh, hardware or the uh, the cabinet right now, and it looks like something that crawled out of 2001. It's beautiful. Yeah, well, it turns out that we actually got a cameo in uh, the movie Soylent Green. They wanted to have one of our units. <laughs> right, that's cool. So what? when did you sell the first one? What year? Just so I can have a little bit more context. When did you sell the first computer space? November 69. Wow, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. And it looks like, I mean, it, 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 what, what was the actual game uh, mechanic? Rocket ship, flying saucer. The flying saucer was trying to shoot down the rocket ship. You were flying the rocket ship trying to shoot the flying saucer. So you had a shoot mechanism and a dodge mechanism. You were able to move around the screen. Well, that was one of the problems. Um, it used Newton's second law. So, wow. The if you were an engineer, you understood what was going on. You, in order to slow down, you had to turn around and retro thrust if you wanted to move. You know, it was all about applying vectors and, and accelerations. And. To a working man's bar, that was totally baffling. Oh my God! To me, it's baffling because, like, I, like I'm getting all these chills because I'm thinking, okay, so asteroids had a similar mechanic, right? Of similar to Newton's second law of right. motion and, and momentum and like all that kind of stuff. And like now, I'm I'm realizing, well, wait a minute, this is actually something that was around 20 years before that, <laughs> you know? And like, it, it, it's it, it's kind of hard for me, Nolan. You've kind of shattered my entire understanding of this industry. As somebody who claims to know what they're talking about, no, it's just just filling in holes. Now, now your now your knowledge is complete. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? So, what's that seventh lucky accident? How did you start to evolve? Um, the company that made Computer Space was this already registered as an Atari product? No, it was Nutting Associates, and I guess maybe the next happy accidents is that Nutting. They were a bunch of idiots. And uh, sometimes a group of idiots is <laughs> inspirational. Because yeah, you can say, this, these guys have a company, and they are buffoons. If I, you know, first of all, I said, I'm not going to hook my st lucky stars to these bozos. The second is, it says... I'm going to do it. I'm going to be, see, uh, you know, I'm going to set up my own company. I can't possibly screw things up as bad as they do. Right, right. right. And, and just, just for context, how old are you around this time? 28. 28. Okay. So, so a very young man. Yeah. So, um, so I guess at that time, um, the next happy accident was, when, when I left Nutting, in order to keep the lights on, our plan was not to be a full manufacturer, but to be a research and development house for guys that had factories and money and market clouds. Sure. And so um, I flew to Chicago and got a deal with Bally to design for them a video game. Oh, wow. And, and I got a, when I left Nutting, I got a, a second contract with them to design a follow-on to computer space. Mm. So I had with those two contracts that gave me cash flow along with my route to sort of keep the lights on and, and we had enough that we could actually hire somebody. So that person was Al Alcorn and he was coming to work on the same day that I went up to um, Burnley game and saw the Odyssey game. Mm. And so in some ways it was a, another happy accident. Sure. Because the happy accident was I saw this game. I was, you know, and, and I said, hey, there's another company. I thought I was alone in the video game business. Right. <laughs> what, a, well, what an amazing feeling. What an amazing feeling that was. Well, it was. It was, it was um, you know, gave you a certain amount of confidence. Oh, and then you hear, oh, somebody showing a video game in the Berlin game Hyatt. Um, right. And so I had to go up and check it out. Well, it was the Odyssey, and it was fuzzy, and, it, 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 you know, no sound and no score. And 
you know, uh, it was okay. But I said, hey, this this technology is is Stone Age, and I've got a I've got a Ferrari. Right. Um, but I looked around. At the, they had four systems set up, and there were people playing them and laughing and having a good time. Right. And so I looked at it and I said, huh, I wonder what our technology, you know, our technology would just wipe this, wipe this out. And, um, and so coming back, I knew that Al was, Al, Al's first day, I thought I'll just sign Al because it'll be a good starter project for him. Never thinking it was going to be commercial. Right. It's just, it just a training project for him. And uh, and so another happy accident. But the game turned out to be fun. And uh, and compact. And compact and cheap. Right. And easy to build. And um, so I thought, self, huh. I've got this game now. It's pretty good. People love it. Maybe I can get Bally to accept it because uh, Bally wanted me to do a driving game, which had sort of the same technical issues that Computer Space did. It was, sure. it was a harder project, a lot harder project. Well, I thought maybe they'll take Palm. So I went back, demonstrated to them, and, uh, and this is another happy accident. They said no. <laughs> Which is the best news now? Now that I understand more of the story, that's the best news you could have ever heard. Exactly. So, before I got on the airplane, I called the office, and the, while I was in Chicago, they had put a instance of Pong in the local bar, mm. and it had failed. Because the quarter, the, the cash box was too small and it totally filled up and it wouldn't take any more money. Wow. Wow. Chills, chill number two. That's, that's, that's great. So all of a sudden, I was faced with a game that was a, was a megastar. I mean, you could make money at $10 a week. A good game was considered $20 a week or a day. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, Thirty dollars a week was a blockbuster. Really, we were doing fifty dollars a week. Wow! So we were so off the charts to the good side, and uh, and I just looked at that and I said, okay, even if I have to operate them, it, you know, I can make it. So on the airplane coming back, I knew how much cash we had in the bank, how much the parts would be. And I figured out that we had enough money that we could build just 12 of the units. And, uh, and, and if everything went to shit, we could still keep the lights on. Right. 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 That's and, amazing. And is this when the official corporation, LLC, what have you, of Atari was born? Um, just, no, it was slightly before that. It was June 27th, 1972. Wow. That's the official yeah. birthday. Yeah. And the first Pong didn't ship until November. Wow. That year. And, and this is something that I've always, like, I thought that I kind of deduced this over my sort of fandom of your work, you know, over the years. Was the name of Atari something that you had taken um, because you were a fan of the game Go, like, like did the game Go have any kind of personal meaning to you? That was absolutely it. And, that you, you know, tr absolutely. I, I mean, I've been a Go player since I was in college. Oh, wow. And uh, I played number two board on the university chess team. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm... Hey, I'm I'm just a card carrying geek every year. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen, man. Yeah. And uh and the number one board at chess taught me how to play Go. He was Korean. Mm. And uh and frankly, once I learned Go, 
chess lost interest for me because Go was is a more elegant game. Right. You know, I, I, I've never, I love playing chess. I play still, I'd say a few times a week and I, I still have never dipped my toes into Go. I've, I've looked into it and the complexity, there's a huge barrier to enter uh, to get in there. And, and, you know, and also to find other players. I, I mean, online, I'm sure I could find a million games, but um, it's just not something that I've actually tackled. You should do it. There's, there's one that I consider to be pretty good. It's called OGS. OGS? Yeah. And it's like an online multiplayer go kind of lobby. You like get in there and you got quick it. and dirty. Cool. And, and, and they, they have some lessons too. Right. And then, so the, the move Atari is like a specific move in the game of Go. And what does that move mean in the game of Go? It's not as much a move as it is a situation. Oh, interesting. And, and um, the situation is, if you don't do something about this, I'm going to capture your group of men. Ooh. So, so it's, it's like, like an eminent danger. It's like there, there, there's like a... It's like a guard A in chess. Huh. That's amazing. And it's such a beautiful word, and it has so many nice vowels, and it kind of rolls off the tongue. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, you know, it turns out, and I didn't know this at the time, but it also means jackpot with a slot machine or a pachinko machine. Oh, really? It also means bullseye if you're if you're shooting arrows. So it's it's a metaphor for win. Right. And in fact. Uh, going to Japan <clears throat> and they say Atari very good name for a company but <laughs> but for Japanese maybe too boastful <laughs> oh, right 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 which is like uh, you know in um, for Rockstar Games like this is not as interesting a story as that but um, when uh, when Take Two Interactive bought uh, BMG Interactive uh, from Bertelsmann Music Group, they moved uh, BMG over to New York, and um, you know they they couldn't call themselves BMG Interactive anymore. So then um, the the guy who was running it, a gentleman named Sam Hauser, a very very intelligent uh, young man uh, at the time, was like, "Well, we used to be BMG Interactive. We come from the music space and all that stuff. So let's be Rockstar Games, which is also kind of like a very boastful kind of like proud, like we're the you know we're the ones, you know, yeah, um, yeah. which is which is very cool. Um, so so when the the Pong um, gamble of of building the thirty machines obviously worked out uh, extremely well for you." And uh, when did you decide to kind of make that leap into going head to head with the style, you know, the Odyssey style of device of making a kind of a home device where you can bring the arcade to your living room? Because that, I think, is probably the most important moment in the history of video games is when it came inside your living room and now you control the fun within your four walls. You know, this is going to sound a little bit like a cop-out. Yeah, no worries. But a lot of our Atari had the ethos of being at the forefront of technology. Mm. Was that and your so mission? What, like, did, did you did you even have a mission back then, or not really? Oh, yeah. Innovative leisure, you know, uh, work hard, that's play a, hard. That's a beautiful, uh, yeah. And and but the the thing that we sort of our core technology was digital, and and analog technology was <clears throat> just not as good. Mm. It wasn't crisp, and it was it was what the Odyssey was. So we could have probably done got into the home because you could do some cheap tricks uh, and hit the price points. Price point had to be under 100 bucks. Mm. But then along came in-channel technology. That is the full, you know, 
a thousand gates on a chip. And all of a sudden we said, hey, we could put a pawn on this chip, buy it for eight bucks, put five dollars worth of plastic around it, <laughs> five bucks worth of glue parts and a cat and a, and a box and sell it for 70 bucks. Right. Retail. Right. And, and, and so the first Pong was a standalone machine. It was a self-contained standalone machine. Exactly. Based right. on one LSI chip. Right. Right. And channel. And, and I, 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 I basically say end channel because end channel was the only technology that, that go fast. A lot of people don't know that, that silicon didn't want to go fast in, mm. in, in the 70s. Right. And, uh, you know, now when I see, you know, computers with multi gigahertz clock speeds, I just scratch my head. I mean, right. We, we, it was we were struggling with megahertz. <laughs> right. No, no, no. Oh, God, you know, of course, of course. I um, you know, one of my most prized possessions, and I don't know, like, I mean, I'm jumping way ahead of the story here, but one of my most prized possessions as a kid was, was an Atari ST. Um, oh, yeah. you, you know, that I had um that you know I used to be able to play so many cool games with. Um, you know, I had the Commodore 64 and then I graduated to an ST. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just phenomenal. And I think that that machine, oh God, I want to say it was eight megahertz, maybe less. I don't think it was that fast yet. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe four, maybe it was four or something, or, or maybe even less than that. Maybe even less than that, you know, because I remember my first 286 was 20 megahertz and then my 386 was 33 megahertz. Um, so anyway, um, what, one thing that that so obviously i'm assuming that pong completely sells out oh yeah and then where did the brain um jump happen to into your mind where it's like hey we can go beyond a standalone machine and we can have a machine that's interchangeable with multiple experiences again the same thing a microprocessor came along mm. that was fast enough that we could do a video game with some help chips. And then once you have, oh, and maybe to just talk geek a little bit. Yeah, please do, man. Please do. I'm, this is fascinating for me. The, the early days of the, of the prior to 1977, mm -hmm. 76, they were not von. <clears throat> none of the games were von Neumann architecture. There was no software. There was no. It, they were all hardware, basically state machines. Right. So we basically started with a with a crystal clock, and you divided it down and flip flops and and boolean algebra to, until you got what you want. And, and could you give me just like a kind of back of the cereal box explanation of what you mean by by no software? Meaning that, for example, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, the games were built on um, a language. The, the, there was a programming language to them versus right. The and, and there was two kilobytes of RAM in each cartridge, and so right. it was a different program. Right, right. Where, where, where hardware means that there is no programming language. It's literally manipulating electricity to turn things on and off. Bingo. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. And you were able to somehow create what? Like, like, like sort of electrical grids, like on a piece of paper so that you can predict what would happen inside of the chip set? No, the, the the early state machines were so damn deterministic, you know, that because uh, they were all based on on clock. And, you know, for example, the every object was basically eight bits. So 256 by 256. Mm. But here's the funny thing. The grid actually was 255 by 255. Mm. Why? 
because any motion object had the same number. And so what you needed to do is <laughs> you would preset everything. If you wanted it stationary, both horizontal and vertical would be 256 by 256. Mm -hmm. If you wanted it to move to the left, you would start with 256, 256 by 256. And so every frame, it would precess one to the left. Oh, interesting. Now wow. that's, that's actually, you know, kind of, and the same thing in the vertical collection. And so, so then, and this is how you would predict which sprites would turn on or off. Precisely. Wow. And 256 by 256, that sounds reasonable. I mean, that sounds like, you know, like if you understand that that's your grid, you know, the imagination could start to fly with those kind of things. Yeah, we have star field and, you know, objects and all kinds of things in that environment. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, man. That is absolutely amazing. So then how did you make that transition? Was it... Was there ever a situation where now you have a bunch of venture capitalists looking at you on Sand Hill Road saying, wow, this, this Nolan Bushnell kid seems like he's really onto something. Let's throw a bunch of money at him. Or was it more that you were kind of building out of your own fuel that you were generating? Both. Both. But also understand that venture capital was just being invented. Sure. There were only three venture capitalists in the whole valley. Right, right. One was Arthur Rock, who basically funded Intel. Um, Sutter Hill and Sequoia. And Sequoia right. put money in. But when they say throw a bunch of money in, they, they did a million and a half bucks. That was the total round. That's it. Yeah. Do you, you know, this is probably too personal, but do you mind me asking what evaluation they gave you at that point? Forget eight that. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about no, that. Eight that. million. It's no big deal. It was eight million. Yeah. So, so they gave you a million and a half bucks based on an eight million evaluation. So they took relative that much of the company at that point. Correct. And then was this what gave you the kind of momentum to say, hey, I'm going to build a i'm gonna build the atari and correct me if i'm wrong is the 2600 the first one that came out or was there one before that that had multiple cartridges no nope, that's it well there was one that fairchild did um but it was actually a little bit of a cheat mm -hmm. uh it was called uh system f or f something but, but, it, was, but it was an atari uh system it was not Atari. It was okay. It was got it. Got it. Was... So there was somebody else in the market that was trying to experiment with a similar concept. Yeah. Gotcha. They just they just didn't have the game chops. Right. Right. Because you kind of had built that discipline by making games now at this point for over ten years, right? Like you already had ten years of experience, over ten years in making video games before you sat down and and did the twenty six hundred. Correct. And it turned out that the successful cartridges were all based on our old coin op stuff. Right. Right. And and so tell me a little bit about how, you know, the 2600, because for me, the 2600 is really what it's all about um, in terms of my history. Like I remember getting my first 2600 back in 1983. And, you know, I, actually, I think 82 is when I got my first 2600. And that completely changed my life, you know, and, and it's so funny because the other day I actually still have a functioning one with the, you know, with the composite or, or like with the little thing in the back where you turn the thing on TV and, you know, Atari and like all that stuff. Um, and I was playing combat with my brother because uh, I have it down in my house in the keys and combat is like an incredibly fun game to this day. And now that I think about it, um, Combat also uses the same kind of Newton's second law in terms of its core kind of game mechanic of mo or of movement inside of the game space. Did you guys develop combat inside of Atari? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, beautiful game. To this day, it's like, it's a game that, you know, what has like 50 different game modes, tanks, jet fighters, you know, uh, uh, um, propeller planes. I mean, it, it like talk about being extremely ambitious. That game is gigantic. You know, they were games in those days were written by one guy. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that that that's unbelievable. And was was combat like the, when, when you were building the twenty six hundred? Did you say? Okay, we need a a library of titles that we're going to launch with. Um, and did you develop all of these titles internally, or were there some that were being developed by external uh, studios as part of this launch? Hundred percent internal. We didn't want anybody else to know how to do it. Right, 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 right. Our idea was put a wall garden around what we're doing and be the only guy in town. Right. No, no, that's that's fascinating. That's um, you know, absolutely fascinating. Do you remember the first time you played a demo or anything related to something like combat? Oh yeah, it was uh, that the twenty six hundred core computer was actually developed in in our labs in Grass Valley, California, up in the Gold Country, and uh, and we would actually fly in a Piper Cub up there. <laughs> Al was a pilot. And oh, wow. Did you ever learn how to fly? Yes and no. Um, I, I, got, I got up to how to fly and land and all that. And somebody said, flying is not about transportation. Right. You got to be on the ball all the time because if you, you really do. And so I realized that that was not how my brain works. <laughs> right, right, right. Because I mean, you can't go off and, and into the clouds, so to speak. Well, literally, there are times I end up in my driveway. Right. With no recollection of how I got there. Oh, interesting. Okay. So. I, I said I just extrapolated that to being on a on an airplane, and I said that that would probably kill me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't go any further than that. But Al would take the little Piper Cub, which is a beautiful plane, and you guys actually would fly it wasn't up. a Piper. It, it was actually a, a, he bought a um, a Skymaster. Oh, okay. you know, with, with the propeller in the front and the propeller in the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and was there a kind of trepidation or, or was, was the Atari 2600 a risky move or did you know that your confidence was so high at this point that you knew that it was only a matter of putting it together? Pretty much. Right. What the hard part actually was not the tech, the hard part was hitting the price points that you needed to. Right, right. Because how much did, um, I mean, now I completely forgot because my parents bought it for me, of course, so I completely forgot. But how much was the price point for the standalone Atari that came with Combat and or Pac-Man? What, what, what was that price point? X-Factory, it was, it was 139 bucks. Mm. And then the and retail? Aimed at a retail of 179, 189. Wow, that's cheap. That's like a really good. I mean, look, obviously the the finances were very different back in those days, but it still seems very reasonable, right? For like something that's never been seen before to get it under 200 bucks. And maybe that's why so many families were able to actually get that. Yeah. And and the story of Pac-Man. Uh, Pac-Man was not an IP that you guys developed internally, or or no, it was not. That one, that one was one of the early games that had a coin-op success, and then you adapted it over to the Atari. Correct. As it, as, as as we did Space Invaders. Right, right. So you guys, now, though, this was it, this was after my time. This is after your time. Yeah. Wow. Because Pac-Man wasn't Pac-Man at one point, I think, was also one of the games that came with the system. I don't remember. 
Yeah. So one thing that, I, that, that I've always wondered about um, the Atari is that the Atari, like, for example, the, the kind of product design of, of, um, of um, um, the uh, Space War game is very futuristic, very 2001. But the Atari 2600 is wood. It's very earthy. It's very, like, furniture-esque. Like, how did you kind of, what was the process in your mind of what you wanted the Atari console to look like? I wanted it to be an appliance, not a toy. Mm, interesting. Because you, you have a different aesthetic as to what something costs if it's an appliance. And so appliances had wood grain. In fact, the retailers at the time talked about white goods, refrigerators, stoves, washing machines, and brown goods. Mm -hmm. TVs, you know, phonographs, what have you. And we wanted to be a brown good. Wow. So, like, you made a conscious decision to say, I don't want to be a futuristic thing that looks like something out of the future. I don't want, I don't want to look like a toy. There were a lot of futuristic-looking toys. Right, right. Like the odd, like... Um, like uh the sinclair yeah yeah what what you know yeah, yeah the 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 one that it came with the screen i forget what it's called right now um, yeah there, there was one in the similar time period that came with a screen um anyway it, it doesn't matter but the point is is that those were kind of more, more futuristic looking where the atari just felt like this it was wooden you know i mean at least that you know that's what i remember is, is that it had like a wood feel to it like you know, and like very simple buttons, like or, or knobs, almost like an airplane, actually. Like you know, with like very simple switches, where you yep. like turn turn on the battery, and you know, it, it, you know the uh, the magneto and the engine. You know, like it was very, you know, like it was very analog. Yep. Um, so one thing that I have to ask, there, there's two things. One of them, I, I think, I kind of feel like it might be. Both these might be touchy, so no worries if you don't want to chat about it. But there was a game that you guys made that's a masterpiece of a game um, that's playable to this day as a fun experience. And the game is Breakout. And the legend that I heard is that this game was designed and created by a man named Steve Jobs. Um, is this a, is this an accurate um, uh, legend in my mind? Kind of. Kind of. It was actually my design, personally. Oh. One of the few. But we had a system where engineers would bid on it, on projects. All the engineers thought that ball and paddle games were over. Right. So, so I asked Steve if he'd do it. That's now, so cool. Steve didn't wasn't the great engineer, mm. but Steve Wozniak was a savant. Right. And, and so I put him on the night shift, knowing that if he was on the night shift, that, that Waz had come over and do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, that happy accident number 11. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I called it hiring two Steves for the price of one. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. That's incredible. And uh, so, so Steve and Steve learned how to collaborate with each other during this process. Precisely. Yeah. And do you remember what your impression, because like one of the most influential things in my career is something that Steve Jobs says that he's like the number one job of a CEO is to recruit good people, you know, um, and, and it's a lesson that has stuck with me forever. I'm a CEO of my company. Uh, you know, this is the third company that I'm trying to build at this point of, you know, sold two other ones. And it's something that always sticks with me that my most important job is recruiting good talent. Um, and obviously, in these early days, it sounds to me like you did exactly that. Do, do you remember what it was like when you were recruiting or when you interviewed or, or how Steve came into it that you recognize, okay, this is somebody that I want here to work with us, both Steves? Well, what you want, it's actually a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. You not only want to hire the best, but it's better 
if you create a reputation and a work environment mm. in which the best want to come to you. Right, right, which is a lot harder, which is very difficult to do. And that's where the work hard, play hard, you know, don't come to work if you don't want to. We'll treat you like an adult. We're going to have beer bus on the on the dock, you know, <laughs> if, you know, and and it was a thing where we consciously tried to have it appear that you were this was the best thing, the best place to work. For example, mm. another example. Yeah. If you were an engineer in Silicon Valley, you were probably in a bullpen or a cubicle. Mm -hmm. We gave every engineer a private office with the door on it. Right. That was kind of a big deal. Sure. And, and our logic was that distract, you know, when you're programming, when you're an engineer, the, the worst thing that can happen if you've got everything in your head and all of a sudden you're distracted. And we felt that the, that labor was expensive and, and space wasn't. Mm. Right, right, but, right. But it was also a, a, but it can go a long way, right? Like office space becomes this very uh, important perk, you know, for, uh, for somebody in your staff. Yeah. And then we always had games in the in the in the room, and the fact that you didn't ha wear, have to wear a coat and tie, you could come in 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 boxer shorts if you wanted to. Mm. And, and where where was um, your your office located during these times? It was in uh, it was just outside of uh, Saratoga, California, or I mean okay. uh, uh, Los Gatos. Which is which is Silicon Valley considered uh, like kind of yeah by it's San sort Jose. of on the edge. It was on okay. the edge south of San Jose. This Incidentally, unfortunately, I have a four o'clock that I'm gonna have to pop onto. Oh yeah, yeah, man, no worries. I've it's we've we've been going now for fifty minutes, and you've been so generous with your time, Nolan. I I um I feel like, you know, I can keep talking to you for the rest of the week. And obviously well, let's that's do what it, I'm let's saying. do it. let's do another one in in a couple of months. Okay. All right. Let's do part two in a couple of months, Nolan. Yeah, because we can talk about Chuck E. Cheese and we can talk about uh, Exodexa. Yeah, yeah. Because like you know, like I have a whole series of questions, and I apologize if I went too slowly on it. It's just such a, a beautiful. Oh no, I get riffing on things and that. So yeah, because like I'd love to also hear about what you're doing now. You know, because like um, I'm sure it's fascinating as well. So look, uh, Nolan, thank you so much, sir. Is there anything, any links you want me to leave behind? Anything? Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy. Be good. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. You have a beautiful day and a beautiful weekend. Thank you. But Wow. Nolan Bushnell.